Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am Michelle from Consolidated Planning Group. I am really excited to be here today because it's so important to understand the key steps to transition success with your special needs loved one. There are so many different things that you need to know about, and we're going to go through quite a bit of them today. So this, um, this webinar has a lot of information, and I would love for you to go ahead, put any questions or comments that you have in the chat box. I cannot see you or hear you since we're in webinar mode, but I know you're out there. And I do want to get to as many questions of yours as I possibly can today. So feel free to put those in the chat box. I have put the contact information for Consolidated Planning Group. I'm also going to put my name and email address in there so that you can reach out to me directly if you need anything. Um, please go ahead and put your questions and comments in the chat. So. Again, I'm Michelle Morris from Consolidated Planning Group. This webinar is being recorded and we will send it to you later on today in your email. We also typically send the slides. Um, so you should get that to whatever email you registered with um, when you registered for this webinar. So um, Consolidated Planning Group, a little bit about us before we get started. We are a holistic, independent special needs financial planning firm. So we are holistic in that we look at your entire financial uh, picture. We want to make sure that all of the puzzle pieces are fitting together and working in your best interest. We are independent. We are non-captive in, in that we work with several different third-party asset managers and life insurance companies to help make sure that our clients have everything that they need. And we are special needs focused planners. Um, it's not just something that we do once in a while or something that we can do if we come across a client who has a child with a disability. This is what we do every single day. About 95% probably, of our clients have kids with some kind of intellectual or developmental disability. It's not just once in a while. And we are financial advisors. We are fully licensed in securities and insurance, financial planning. We can put together a plan for you and your family. We are located in Houston, uh, well, just outside of Houston in Sugarland. And we work all across Texas and all across the United States. So it doesn't matter where you are, we can help you with planning for the future. Now, today's webinar is going to talk a lot about um, Texas services and benefits, state benefits. Um, so please stay if you're from a different state. Many of the things I talk about will still apply to you, although some won't. Uh, so I just want to put that out there, you know, that this is truly what we do day in and day out. This is the, um, the life that we live, and we're here to help you. So like I said, we've got a lot of things to talk about today. Families come to us for things like lifetime protection plans. You know, you want to protect your family in case you cannot work anymore or, you know, if you become disabled or pass away early or the main breadwinner in your family passes away, what's going to happen to your loved ones? Um, we want to help you with care plans for your, your child or your individual with the disability. You know, they will need care once you're gone. And if they can't hold a job or be completely independent, it's going to have to come, the help is going to have to come from you. They will receive certain benefits that will help offset their costs, but it typically does not pay for everything. And the family is still going to have to help the, the individual um, pay for the rest of their care. We do a lot of transition planning and that's what we're going to be talking a lot about today. You know, what happens when your child graduates from high school um, and when they turn 18, you know, you don't want them to graduate to the couch. 
You don't want them to turn 18 and have legal and financial issues because you haven't set things up properly. A lot, a lot changes in those different transition periods. And then you also go through a transition period when your, your loved one is transitioning from living at your home to wherever they will be living in the future. Um, so we have a lot to cover. We help families with ABLE accounts and understanding benefits like SSI and SSDI, Medicare, Medicaid. We help you understand your special needs trust and find someone who can help you set that up. Um, and we're here to educate you and to advocate for you. You know, there are over 263,000 financial advisors across the United States. And out of those 263,000 financial advisors, fewer than 200 of them focus on special needs planning. That's fewer than a tenth of a percentage of all the financial advisors in the U.S. who understand the nuances and it's exactly what needs to be done to help your loved one. Uh, so you are definitely in the right place when you are working with Con Consolidated Planning Group. So welcome to our webinar. Thank you for joining us and thank you for being here. Uh, so getting started, when you're thinking about what do I really need to do to set things straight and get ready to plan for my loved one? First of all, we would like for you to develop a letter of intent. We're going to get into what that is, but keep that in the back of your mind. Develop a letter of intent. Work with professionals who really understand your needs and what you are going through, like financial planners who work with families with uh, special needs loved ones, like Consolidated Planning Group. Um, you also want to work with an estate planning attorney who focuses on special needs matters to make sure that they can help you with um, not only your will and typical estate planning, but special needs trusts and um, guardianship and things like that that you might need for your loved one. We want you to gather together all of your planning documents. You know, what do you already have in place for the future? What do you have in place legally? For your child? What do you have in place in terms of your retirement needs, your savings accounts, um, any of those things? It's really best to know where you are before you try to start moving on to the next phase or planning for your future. And we want you to think about what you want the future to look like for your loved one and for yourself. What does your retirement look like? What do you want for your, your loved one? What does their future look like? And, and, and start with those questions to get a feel for what needs to be done. So let's cover that letter of intent really quickly. Um, the letter of intent is a document that you as the parent will put together um, it is not a legal document. You don't have to get this approved or have the court sign off on it. You do not have to have it notarized. This is just something for you um, to write. Basically, you're telling somebody who might need to step into your shoes how to take care of your family and especially your loved one with the, the disability or the, the special needs. So think about if you were gone tomorrow and I had to come to your house and start taking care of your child, what would you want me to know? So I used to be an English teacher before I came into the world of financial uh, planning and, and advising. Um, so as an English teacher, I would say, start this on your computer and start with the facts because it's easy to write facts that you know. This is information that you know about your child, like who your family is, family members. Um, when, what are your child's diagnoses? When were they born? When were they diagnosed? What medications are they on? Start with the facts. Um, what do you have set up in terms of government benefits and their living arrangements, accommodations for them at school and at home, uh, their educational history, 
Have they ever had a job? All of those kinds of things. Think about that. And then think about, you know, them as a person, their personality. What do they love? What do they hate? What is going to set them off on a, a horrible day? And if they're having a horrible day, what can you do to turn it around? Um, things like, what do they like to wear? What do they like to eat? What spirituality and value systems do you want in place for them? What about their recreational habits, their hobbies, their activities that they like? Um, think about the legal side of things. Who are their legal guardians? Where do you keep documents? Anyway, I would start this on my laptop and print the first version and put it in, you know, if you have a binder, that goes through all your child's information. I would put it right in that binder, right at the top, just in case. Don't leave this on your computer behind passwords and locked screens and nobody can find it. Put it in a binder that somebody can find if, if you were gone tomorrow. Then, you know, as your family grows and evolves, maybe every six months or every year, you should revisit your letter of intent update things, add things, switch things around. Make sure you have other family members and your loved one um, help you with this because maybe some other insight will come from your other family members or your loved one might help you fill in the blanks in terms of what they like and hate and what, what they want for their future. Um, and then as you update this document, you can just print the latest version and replace the one that's in your binder so that it's always updated and fresh. Um, I think that would be the best way to go about this. Of course, this is yours. This is your letter of intent. So do it your way. Get your family involved and, and just write kind of a love letter to your family, what you want for them, how you want them to be taken care of. You know more about your family and your loved ones than anybody else on this planet ever will. So that's why you should do a letter of intent. The next thing that we see is that many people worry about how their child's care is going to be funded once they're gone. And this is a very big concern because it's not cheap. Um, if your child needs care for the rest of their life and they can't work or they can't have a full-time job that's going to provide health care and, and benefits and a, a salary that's going to keep them afloat, what's going to happen? Well, first of all, in order to bolster any savings and monies that you can set aside for them, you need to make sure that they stay eligible for state and federally funded programs that they um, they can get. You don't wanna mess that up, even if you think, oh, we've got their care covered, we've got plenty of money, you still want to make sure that they are able to get SSI and Medicaid. Later in life, they'll get SSDI and Medicare. These are important things because they can help pay for so much in your child's future. In order to make sure that you keep those benefits, you need to establish a special needs trust so that your current life insurance and any other assets that you currently have can uh, flow right into that special needs trust when you pass away. You know, your life insurance will um, go tax-free to your heirs. So it's an easy way to fill up that special needs trust and make sure that your loved one is taken care of. You can also establish an ABLE account for them. Those are the two places that your loved one can have money where it won't, won't count against them for SSI purposes or Medicaid purposes, the, the special needs trust and the ABLE account. So let's go into the SSI side of things. Most kids and most families will not qualify for SSI benefits until your child turns 18. Now, the reason for that is because when your child is a minor, under the age of 18, they're going to look at the parents' assets and income to see if you qualify for this program. 
their asset and income limits are very, very low. So most people will not qualify. Um, your assets need to be under $2,000 if you're an individual, under $3,000 if you're married. So most families have more than $3,000 in the bank. So you would not qualify for SSI uh, because of having too many assets. They would also count 401ks and IRAs and retirement plans against you. So if you have any of those things. Also, the income limit. The income limit for SSI for an individual is $1,550. So if you make more than $1,550, um, as a parent, you will not be able to get SSI for your child. Now, when your child turns 18, all of a sudden, they're not going to look at the parent's income and assets anymore. So they're only going to look at your child's income and assets. And many of our ch children cannot work. And we can help control their assets to make sure that they don't have more than $2,000 in the bank. So when your child turns 18, you can qualify for SSI benefits or they can qualify for SSI benefits. You wanna go online and start your application just as soon as they turn 18. Don't do it before because you won't qualify. Uh, but you can go to this link where it says apply for SSI online and get your application started. They're going to backdate your payment to whenever you start this application, even if it takes several months, which it does, sometimes up to a year to start getting those benefits, they will back pay you. So that's really nice. So you'll get a large chunk of money at the beginning. You do have to spend that or get it out of their account uh, within nine months. After that, you'll get the normal um amount each month. So you want to make sure that you have evidence that shows that your child has a disability. Uh, that would be their medical history, their doctor's contact information, address, phone, name, a list of your child's diagnoses, uh, what medications they're on. If they are working, the Social Security Administration is going to want to see pay stubs. And they're going to want to see how much money is in your child's bank account if they have one. You might even want to contact your child's primary care physician and ask to see a copy of their records, their medical history that the doctor's office has. Because you want to look at that medical history and make sure that everything is in there that shows that they are disabled. You can look at something called the Social Security Blue Book. You could just Google Social Security Blue Book. Let me put that in the chat for you. I didn't spell security right. Anyway, you're going to look up the Social Security Blue Book and make sure that anything they have as a diagnosis, you look up in the blue book because what this will tell you is, you know, for example, if your child has autism, you need to show that your child has autism in their doctor's records and you are ITY. I'm having trouble multitasking today. Anyway, you want to make sure that it's in their doctor's records that they have this diagnosis of autism, but also that you can prove that it is, um, you know, holding them back from being able to have a job or, you know, maybe it has to, if they have a seizure disorder, it has to be within the past three months that they've had a seizure or, you know, whatever guidelines they say in the social security blue book, you can check and make sure that those items are, are documented in their medical history. Um, so after you apply, there are some things that you might want to expect are going to happen. First of all, what they don't tell you is that as you're applying for SSI, sometimes you're also filling out an application at the same time for SSDI. Now, 
you should qualify for SSI when your child turns 18, as long as they meet those income and asset guidelines. But it's possible that you will not qualify for SSDI at the 18th birthday. And that's okay. We don't want that. We want you to get SSI first because SSI comes with Medicaid. So we want you to qualify for SSI and Medicaid first. What we see sometimes is that people will get a letter and our clients will call us and they're going to be panicked and say, we got a letter that says that we were denied for benefits. But if you look closely at the top, it says SSDI, you're going to be denied for that because you haven't qualified yet. Um, so you might get a denial letter. Don't panic. The real letter will come later. It could take up to a year and sometimes even longer to have the decision made once you submit your application. After your local office finalizes your complete application, they're going to send it to the Disability Determination Services. Now in Texas, that office is in Austin and you can call them at the phone number listed below. Each state has their own Disability Determination Services office and each state has your own um, local social security branches, but most of this information should apply for all states. So once the DDS receives your file, they're the ones who are going to call and get the medical records from your, do your doctor's office um, and review the material in there to make sure that they meet criteria for having a disability. You can call the Disability Determination Services Office and they will actually answer the phone. So that's pretty cool. Now I mentioned SSDI and the fact that that comes later. So let me explain a little bit. When you as a parent are in your late 60s, hopefully, and you apply for your own social security retirement benefits, that is when your child should be able to apply for SSDI and receive a benefit based on your work history. Now, the reason we want you to do SSI first is like I said, because that comes with Medicaid. So you're going to apply for SSI and you'll have SSI and Medicaid from your child's 18th birthday until whenever you turn on your Social Security retirement benefits or if you as a parent file for disability or if you as a parent pass away. At that point, um, you know, when, when a parent files for their own social security benefits, the child starts receiving a benefit that is equal to half of what the parent is getting. Now, it does not take away from what the parent gets, but the child also gets half. So for me to use round, easy numbers, let's say you as a parent turn on your retirement benefits through the social security office at age 67 or whenever, and you're getting $4,000 a month, your child will start getting $2,000 a month based on your record. You're still going to get your $4,000 and they will get $2,000. Um, that will go on hopefully for several years. After your child is on that benefit for two years, then they will receive Medicare. So the SSI will have dropped off because SSDI is more money and you can't have both of the, those at the same time. So the SSI will drop off. The child will get their SSDI. They will have been on Medicaid. They'll keep the Medicaid. And after two years, they'll be eligible for Medicare as well. So they'll have Medicaid and Medicare. They'll be dual eligible. They'll be getting half of your um, social security benefit amount. And then when you pass away, their social security benefit amount under your record, SSDI, will go from 50%, that $2,000 uh, hypothetical amount, to 75%. They'll go up to $3,000 each month. And your disabled child will get that money for the rest of their life, as long as they're still 
considered disabled. So that's why it's so important that we make sure that we do this all correctly. We sign up in the correct order and we get you and your children the largest maximized social security benefit that you possibly can. Um, we can help you figure that out if you're interested. Um, just contact our office. There are family maximums. Um, it, I think it's like 180% of your benefit. I'm not quite sure on that. The Social Security Department has very complicated um, exclusions and um, complicated ways of figuring out how to get the right amount and how much you're going to get, but we can figure that out for you with the software that we have. So you want to make sure that your assets and your children's assets are going into the right buckets to make sure that they don't miss out on those benefits that they're going to get for the rest of their lives. You want to make sure that if any other family members want to leave money for your loved ones, they also put it in the right buckets. And that bucket would be the special needs trust for the benefit of your loved one or an ABLE account. You never ever want money to go straight to your loved one. So for example, your life insurance, you have beneficiaries set up on your life insurance. Most people just say, oh, if I'm if I die, I want my life insurance to go to my spouse. And if they're not here anymore, then I want it to be equally spread out, distributed between my children. Well, that's great unless you have a child with a disability because you by leaving money straight to your child have just cut off all of their uh, future benefits from social security, Medicaid, Medicare by giving them a large sum of money. So what you do is instead of having your child listed as a beneficiary, you set up a special needs trust and you have that special needs trust be the beneficiary uh, on your child's behalf. If any loved ones, grandma and grandpa want to leave money, aunts and uncles, they need to know about this too. Make sure that anybody who leaves money for your child leaves it to the special needs trust for the benefit of your loved one or to their ABLE account. Just make sure your money's in the right bucket. Now, <clears throat> thinking about transitioning to adulthood, you want to make sure that you have a special needs set, trust set up. You know, you'll need an attorney to help you do that. Um, also, guardianship. When your child is within about six months of turning 18, you can start the guardianship process. And again, you want to talk to an attorney who focuses on these things. They will walk you through what it takes to get guardianship what alternatives there are in case guardianship is not right for you. And they'll help you prepare the documentation. Um, guardianship does require a visit to court. You have to go in front of a judge. You need an attorney and your child will have an ad litem attorney. It can be a complicated and expensive process. Um, guardianship means that basically in the eyes of the law, your child will always be a minor. They won't be able to vote. They won't be able to um, drive a car. They won't be able to sign contracts like for uh, purchasing a home. They won't be able to get married. You're taking their rights away um, and making sure that in the eyes of the law, they're still a minor and, and need your help and guidance. Um, it's very important to review those options with an attorney. So I do see a question in the chat box. I'm gonna go ahead and read that out. When your disabled child is employed and gets SSDI based on their own work, work record, and then later on they retire, are those amounts added together? How do you make sure the amount of SSDI they get doesn't disqualify them from Medicaid? And of course, the waiver programs, which are very, very important. Well, because there is this thing called the Pickle Amendment, you can look this up online. I'll, I'll put it in the chat box, Pickle, 
like the pickle on your sandwich. The pickle amendment uh, was passed and that basically says that if you're on Medicaid and your SSDI or you know your disability um, benefits push you over the limit for Medicaid, you get to keep it. Okay, so um, if anybody at the Social Security office tries to tell you that their SSDI or uh, Medicare amount is going to push them over the limit, say, nope, nope, look at the pickle amendment. You get to keep that. Good question. Let's talk about ABLE accounts. So um, within ABLE account, if you've ever heard of a college uh, 529 college savings plan. That's a 529C. An ABLE account is a different section of the same 529 tax code. This is a 529A. With an ABLE account, the beneficiary is the account owner. And this is for anybody who has a disability that started before they turned 26 years old. Um, you can put money into an ABLE account. That money is invested and it grows tax-free. The income in the account is not taxed. The contributions, unfortunately, you don't get a state, I mean, a federal income tax deduction for putting money into the ABLE account. Now, some states do allow for a state income tax deduction for money that you put into your ABLE account. However, here in Texas, we don't have state income tax, so they cannot give you a deduction for that. Um, but other states, they can, and sometimes they do. So again, the ABLE account will not jeopardize your benefits in terms of SSI and Medicaid and other state and federal programs. So you can use the ABLE account basically to pay for anything, anything that your child needs. Um, ABLE actually stands for Achieving a Better Living Experience. So as long as you can show that you're paying for something that will help your child achieve a better living experience, you can use that ABLE account to pay for it. Even if you use this for food or shelter, excuse me, it will not cause a reduction to their SSI benefits. So the ABLE account, we call this a save to spend account. You don't want to put money in there that's going to be sitting for 30 and 40 years and growing into the millions. You can only put small amounts into the ABLE account. This, well, it's not really a small amount. This year for 2024, you can put $18,000 into the ABLE account. Um, now you never want that amount that's in there to go over $100,000 total or else their social security benefits will be cut off. Um, so $18,000 this year, $100,000 total. Now, if your child is working, they can put additional money into the ABLE account. Um, but again, don't let it go over 100,000. This is only for people with disabilities that started before age 26. And you can use the money on anything that they need. So unlike a traditional college 529 account, that money can only be used for educational expenses. So if you have a 529 college savings account set up for your loved one with a disability, and now you're getting to a point where you're thinking that maybe they're not going to be going to college, maybe they're not going to need that money for educational expenses, you can roll the 529C over to a 529A ABLE account for your loved one. And then they can use that money for anything they need. Um, again, the growth is tax-free. Uh, you can roll it over to another family member as long as they meet the criteria. And at death, it's really important to remember that there is a Medicaid reimbursement clause to the ABLE account. What that means is that when your loved one passes away, if there is still money in their ABLE account, 
Medicaid can come back and claim some of that money as reimbursement for all the money that they have paid out on your loved one's behalf throughout their life. Questions, comments? I don't see any questions or comments in the chat box. Uh, we at Consolidated Planning Group can open an ABLE account for you. There are over 50 different ABLE accounts all across the United States. Almost every state sponsors their own ABLE account, but you don't have to live in that state necessarily um, to have an ABLE account there. So just because you live in Texas doesn't mean you have to use the Texas ABLE plan if you don't want to. Um, some states do say that you have to live there to use their plan, but many more of them do not have that rule. So look for one that has um, reasonable fees, that does good in terms of customer service and has good reviews, one that invests your money wisely and has decent returns in their um, investment history. Okay, that's the stuff you want to look for. You can sign yourself up for any of the ABLE accounts across the United States. If you go through a uh, consolidated planning group, we would sign you up for the ABLE America plan in Virginia. Uh, that's the one we like best for our, our clients. And uh, we can do that for you. So I mentioned that the ABLE account can pay for pretty much anything your child needs, even shelter and food. But there are limits on how much money they can put in, right? So a special needs trust is kind of flip-flopped. They can pay for a lot of different things with their special needs trust, but you cannot or should not use your special needs trust to pay for uh, housing, utilities, any homeowner's insurance or condo charges that are required uh, by the lender or by the condo association. So you should not use your special needs trust if you're on SSI to pay for these things because it does cause a one third reduction in your SSI benefits. Now, if you are at that point in life later on where your child is off SSI and they are now on SSDI, don't worry about this rule. It won't apply to you. But if your child is still getting SSI benefits, you do not want to use the special needs trust to pay for these items, uh, rent, mortgage payments, real estate taxes, utilities like gas, electric, water, or sewage, condo charges, um, homeowner's insurance. You do not want to get cash from your special needs trust. And for now, food is still on the list, but that one's coming off um, in a couple of months. But the difference is with that special needs trust, you can put as much money into it as you want. It can be in the millions and it probably will need to be in the millions to have enough for your loved one to be taken care of after your death. Um, one of the things that we specialize in is helping families figure out how much money needs to be in there to make sure my loved one is taken care of. And then later in life, if you need to, you can transfer money from the trust to the ABLE account to pay for things like housing, um, if that rule doesn't change or if you're still getting SSI benefits. So we want you to think about um, who's going to take care of your loved one in the future when you can't do it anymore. And the time for planning, yes, there's a comment in the chat in the chat box that says, it sounds like it would almost be beneficial to have both of those types of accounts. And yes, we definitely agree. That is what we tell our clients is that the special needs trust and the ABLE account work very well together because they can pay for some things out of one account, other things out of the other kind of account. You can transfer in between bank account, or not bank accounts, but in between the ABLE account and the special needs trust. Use them for different things but they work together. So it's a really good idea to have both a special needs trust and an ABLE account. Now, like I said, the special needs trust would be set up by an attorney. The ABLE account could be set up by us or by yourself. 
Um, we think it's really important to start planning right now. It doesn't matter how old your child is. Now is the time to get started because the sooner you start making plans for the future, the more impact those plans can have in terms of your financial future, in terms of helping you sleep easier at night, knowing that you've got this stuff set up. And in terms of making small changes that will have a large impact rather than waiting for the future where all of a sudden everything is a rush, rush, rush to get things done right now. Um, so it makes things a lot easier to start planning right now. You want to think about educational and residential options. There are a lot of different schools um, all across the United States that have programs for your loved ones at colleges and universities where they could maybe go take just one or two courses or have some mentorship and support at the college level. Um, there are certificate programs. There are tech schools. There's a lot of different options for your loved ones. You might want to start touring transition programs and residential uh, communities. Because if you want your loved one to eventually go live at a residential community, you want to check those out early, make sure that you like what they're doing there, make sure that they're, um, you're signed up for the wait list if there is a waiting list, and also get your loved one familiar with these places because Change is hard. Change is hard for everybody. And if your loved one is going to be moved from your home where you're taking care of them to a group home or a residential community, you don't want your passing and their moving to all happen at once. That's a lot to deal with for anybody. Ideally, you would have your loved one moved into where they're going to be after you die, before you die right? You also want to take a look at, there are vocational options out there through places like the Texas Workforce Commission that can help train and test your loved one and see what is holding them back and keeping them from being able to keep a job. And can we give them some additional training or college courses or mentorship that would help them keep a job? There are a lot of options out there. We always say that you want to make very careful considerations before just thinking that a sibling will step into the role of caregiver. That can cause resentment and obligation on both sides that they just don't want to deal with and we don't recommend it. Uh, for example, the sibling who is going to step into the role of caregiver, you know, they're going to have their own life, maybe their own job, their own family, their own children, possibly. And they're going to see taking care of your loved one, hopefully as a joy, and they're willing and able to do it. But if they're not willing and they're not able, this could be an obligation for them. And you don't want to put that burden on your child. Um, looking at it from the other perspective, here you have this um, individual who has had a loving relationship with their sibling and now sibling wants to act like a parent. They might think, well, you're my sister or my brother. You're, you can't control me. You're not mom. You're not dad. And it could breed a sense of frustration and resentment coming from the um the individual with the, the disability. You don't want that either. So it's important to make careful considerations on both sides before that's your, your chosen setup. Now, here in Texas, we have very, very long waiting lists for the Texas Medicaid waiver programs. These programs are very important. And I'm gonna talk about this with this screen up because I want you to take note of these phone numbers and the link for how to get on the waiver waiting lists. If you're not on these lists, get on them as soon as possible. Um, first of all, call the first 877 phone number. That will get you on the list in Texas for MDCP class and DBMD waivers. Now, MDCP is for medically fragile, me medically dependent, fragile, medically dependent or fragile 
children. And DBMD is for deaf, blind, and multiple disabilities. So not everybody here will qualify for those two, but everybody here would probably qualify for class. Now, some of these waiting lists are pretty short, um, and some of them have 20-year waiting lists. Don't, don't panic, because even if your child does not get their waiver until they're 40, they're still going to be helped by it because these can help pay for things like medications, dental, transportation, nursing hours, respite care, even housing, especially the HCS waiver. You sign up for HCS, Texas Home Living and CFC, which is Community First Choice, through your local intellectual and developmental disability authority, your LIDA. You need to go to yourtexasbenefits.com. That's the website that's going to tell you what waiver programs you're already on and uh, where you are on the waiting lists. And you can even sign up there, okay? Yourtexasbenefits.com. Now, if your child is 21 or over and they are medically dependent, they can be on the Star Plus waiting list. It's not a very long list, um, but Star Plus is for people who are 21 and over who are medically dependent. Now that link at the bottom of the screen is another uh, way to search for your local authority. And uh, that will be a clickable link when you receive these slides later on. I did put a listing of all of the different types of uh, well, some of the different types of waiver programs here in Texas and who they're available to, to, just so that you can look and you can see, you can make sure that your loved one um, meets the criteria for these benefits. Because of course, if you apply for maybe DBMD, deaf, blind with multiple disabilities, and your child does not have deafness or blindness, you're not going to be able to get that waiver. So this listing will help you see which waiver programs might be a good fit for your loved one to make sure that you sign up for all the programs that might benefit them. And you do want to sign up for as many as you can, because, um, you know, that way, if they get the class waiver, maybe their, their name comes up for the class waiver. Uh, you can stay on the other waiting lists. And then if they come up for another one, like home and community-based services or HCS, maybe you'll want to switch over at that point. Okay. No questions. I don't see any questions in the chat box about the waiver programs. Okay, so we're gonna keep going, but don't forget to go to yourtexasbenefits.com. And like I said, the waiver programs are statewide. So if you're in a different state, um, you want to look at what your state waiver programs include. And if there is a waiting list, some states do not have a waiting list at all. Most states, have waiting lists that are a lot shorter than they are here in Texas. Um, not getting into uh, any political discussion, but we have found that states that have legalized marijuana, many of them are using that tax revenue in order to fund these programs. So they either do not have a wait list or they have much, much shorter waiting lists. So if you're in one of those states or you're thinking about moving, um, you can look and see what their wait list looks like online. Okay, some other things to keep on your radar and things that we do webinars about. You know, we do these webinars usually two or three times a week. This week was a little bit slow. We only have one this week, but we talk about so many different things. We have guests on that talk about legal matters, or residential options or school information. So much that you need to know. It would really, really be best for you to sign up for our um, YouTube channel, to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And then that way you're going to get notices of all of the webinars that we do. Things like future care costs and waiver programs and SSI, Medicaid, um, colleges, residential, living facilities, um, guardianship, 
we had someone talking about dental uh, procedures a while back. We've had all kinds of partnerships with different organizations that work with our loved ones. So all kinds of helpful information is out there. If you want to sign up for a specific webinar or receive um, the link to the recording and the slides after the webinars, you can use this link. It will take you to all of the upcoming webinars that we have coming up on our um, website. And if you sign up ahead of time, that way you'll get all of the information, even if you cannot attend live. So that's a pretty cool feature. And you'll get the reminders that the webinar is coming up. This is our entire team. I told you we're a small independent firm. We are members of the Academy of Special Needs Planners. We also have a chartered special needs consultant on staff, and we are national social security advisors. So it, it's truly a small boutique style investment firm, financial advising firm. We are ready to help you. So we have four advisors on our staff. All four advisors work on every single client we have. Uh, you get the benefit of having four brains <laughs> at your disposal. We answer our phones. We uh, don't require you to tell your story over and over and over again because we take notes on all of our clients and we all work hard to get to know what your situation is and make it easy on you, as easy as possible. Our fantastic team of operations staff, they help with all the paperwork, phone calls, setting up appointments, as a matter of fact, um, one of the people on this screen will probably be reaching out to you. You signed up for this webinar with your phone number and email address. So please don't be upset when we call. We are only trying to figure out if you would like to schedule your free consultation. We do offer a consultation for every everybody. Uh, so feel free to pass this along to friends and neighbors and anybody you know who might need us. The consultation is on Zoom, usually about 30 to 45 minutes. We want to get to know you and your family. We do ask for a brief questionnaire to be filled out before we have this consultation. It gives us enough information to be able to talk to you, um, you know, legally with the uh, know your client rules and FINRA and the SEC. We do have to have some level of knowledge of you before we start giving advice. That is why we ask for you to fill out a brief questionnaire before your consultation. But you can use the QR code to schedule, or if QR codes aren't your thing, you can call the office, you can email the office, or you can email me. I did put my email address in the chat box and I'll do that again, um, just to make sure that you have everything you need. Yeah, and also on this page, you'll find the link for our YouTube channel, Instagram page, our podcast, which has some of our webinars on there, and our Facebook page so that you can follow us and see what we have coming up and uh, what where you might be able to get help. So I don't see any other questions in the chat box today. I really appreciate you for being here with me today, taking the time out of your busy schedule to uh, be with me, to ask your questions, to watch this webinar, whether it was live or uh, recorded. Either way is fine with me. Please, like I said, feel free to share our information with your family and friends and loved ones. And I really do hope that I get the opportunity to meet with you personally and answer any questions you have, remind you of next steps you need to take. Please pardon my dog barking if you hear that. Um, and, and let you know what, what steps we can help you with and, and what we cost and how we work and all of that. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks for the, the kind comments in the chat box, Anthony and Greg. I hope you all have a fantastic week. And, uh, and I'll see you again soon in a future webinar. Bye-bye.